Um, so now I want to move into what it is that we probably shouldn't be eating as much of if we're trying to protect our microbiome. And there is uh, one food that I'm going to start with. Any guesses of what we should be eating less of? Sugar. All right, we're all on the same page here. OK, that's great. Too much sugar. <laughs> Americans are eating, on average, two to three times the recommended amount of sugar suggested to us by the American Heart Association and the World Health Organization. So this comes out to something like 76 pounds of sugar per person per year. So that's about one and a half pounds per week. So I'm feeding a family of four, which means I'm gonna to need to use over five pounds of sugar per week in order to, yeah, it's a lot, isn't it? Um, so when I visualize this, when I visualize this five pound bag of sugar, I would have to put it in my breakfast, my salad dressing, my drinks, uh, my condiments, I would have to put that sugar in everything in order to consume that amount in a week. And that is exactly what the processed packaged food manufacturers are doing. So that's how it is that we're consuming so much sugar. Um, one of the absolute worst forms of sugar you can consume is through drinking it. A lot, oftentimes that's going to be high fructose corn syrup. And so this is a food that is the wrong type of fuel for the correct microbiota that you want to reside within your gut. This is quick energy. They don't want quick energy. They want this lower, this slower form of energy that takes them longer to digest. Um, does anyone here have kids, younger kids? A few people do. So one thing that I do like to note is that it is not helpful to tell kids that sugar is bad. The reason for that is they can't understand that logic until they're um, teenagers, until they are in middle school. That's more of the age when you really start talking about this is healthy and this is not. Um, the way that you really encourage healthy eating habits with kids is that you set the example, you provide them with the foods that you want them to eat, and you set the norm for what a diet is supposed to look like. And then you talk about how different colored vegetables it can have different benefits on the body. Uh, so when you're talking to kids about environmental issues too, it's best not to talk about doom and gloom. They, they can't, their brains can't go there until they're older. So when I talk to my kids, you know, and I've had some mess ups with this for sure. I'm not doing this all right. Um, you know, I'm trying to get it right as we're all trying. <laughs> Um, but I talk to them about, you know, it's okay if you have that, but we're also going to eat some of this too. You know, it's good to eat a diversity of foods. You talk about how red foods support your blood, how yellow foods help you heal, green foods support your lungs, carrots help them see at night. These are, this is the extent of the information that young kids need. So I think just setting the example in your house and providing them with nutritious options is the best way to deal with this. Um, now, the other thing with sugar is that it does have measurable negative impacts on our body. So for years, we talked about how it was just a, a, a caloric void. There was no nutrition in sugar. But sugar can bind with proteins or carbohydrates in a process called glycation to form advanced glycation end products. Those are called ages, and they advance the aging process. So there is research connecting ages to a variety of health outcomes, of negative health outcomes to different diseases. And then you can measure how sugar effectively creates ages in the body. The connection that has not been made is sugar to ages to disease. So when you talk to the experts on whether or not sugar is actually toxic, they will tell you that it is not because they have not connected the dots. But to me, it seems like a pretty obvious thing that if sugar is creating ages and ages are associated with disease, then it seems like there's kind of a clear path there. Um, but they don't agree with that. Um, the other thing is that high fructose corn syrup can accelerate the production of advanced glycation end products by about 50 times as much as, as straight table sugar. So there is an actual reason that high fructose corn syrup is, is extremely toxic. So um, this is something that if you want to learn more about sugar and some of the impacts it has on your body, this is something that I have written about in my book. So you can reference that later if you're interested. 
Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about grains because in my search for trying to find a suitable diet to support my children's health needs, grains were one of the foods that made sense to eliminate for a period of time. We, we virtually, um, we ate very little grains, sugar, and dairy for about three or four years. My son's health has drastically improved as a result. Um, and honestly, it's hard to tell if he's just outgrowing these things or if it's something that I've done. These are things I'm never going to know. Um, but I do know that whatever I am doing seems to be working, and so I'm going to keep doing those things. Um, so we do eat grains on occasion. We do eat dairy on occasion. Same thing with sugar. We're eating sugar on occasion as well. Uh, but one of the things that stood out to me about grains is that they contain substances that are not beneficial for your digestive tract um, or just for your body in general. And the one that I'm going to talk about right now are lectins. Lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins that can... One, what they can do is they can deteriorate these linings, so they can be a source of leaky gut, but they're also capable of binding to molecules and transporting them across this membrane. So it's kind of like a double whammy. So the way that you get rid of lectins and grains is that you prepare them in a traditional way. You soak them, you sprout them, and, and you ferment them. So this is not how we are preparing grains at all anymore. I mean, there are people that are making sourdough breads and and that are preparing their grains in these appropriate ways. When we do eat grains, we're pretty much just eating, uh, we do eat some corn chips and things like that. Uh, I do buy organic, which I'll address in a moment as well. Um, but we eat some oatmeal, but I soak that oatmeal and I pour some of the ferment juice out of my sauerkraut or whatever it is that, whatever type of ferment I have lying around, I pour some of that juice, and you can do the same thing with whey, so that you're soaking it in this probiotic formula that helps to ferment it and break those grains down more. So if you are going to be eating grains, they really need to be, they, they should not be processed. You know, and if you are eating grains too, I think that regardless of your choice to eat them or not eat them, there's no reason that we should be eating any one food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single year or every single day of our lives. And that is essentially what we have done with grains and especially with wheat. Um, so with wheat, it has a, when you eat bread, it has a more dramatic impact on blood glucose levels than eating straight table sugar. So when we have tried to demystify our obesity and diabetes epidemics for decades, and one of the things that happened is when we started suggesting that people go low fat and eliminate fat from their diets, we started adding more sugars in, and we started eating more processed carbohydrates. And at that point, we started getting heavier and bigger. And so if you consider that the food that we're eating more commonly than any other food has this really significant impact on your blood sugar, I mean, that helps to explain some of the reason that we're having this issue. Um, the other thing with wheat is that there was an experiment called the Broadbach Wheat Experiment started in 1843. And this was set up as a monitoring system to look at the nutritional value of wheat over time because it is such a valuable crop to us. It's our staple. And we wanted to know how is the nutritional value of this crop changing over time. So we have hybridized wheat a number of times. Hybridization is different than genetic modification. Hybridization is basically just crossing two different species to try to get a more desirable one. So this is something we've done for thousands of years. Um, so we kept hybridizing wheat. It, but the nutritional value of it remained relatively constant until 1960 when we introduced a dwarf variety. What happens with some of these dwarf, it's a hard word to say, dwarf <laughs> varieties is that they have a shallow root system. So a shallow root system is not, doesn't have the same potential to access some of those deeper minerals in the soil when the roots just never reach that far. So in the 60s, we did notice a drastic reduction in the nutritional value of wheat. And then there's all sorts of issues with the way it's processed. I mean, changing from the stone mill to the steel mill. There's, there's a history that I write about a little bit in my book, um, not a lot. David, is it David Perlmutter who wrote Grain Brain? Um, if, you're, if you're interested in learning specifically more about grains and some of the reasons, um, he is a good resource there. But then the other thing with grains, and this is also true for legumes, is that they are being sprayed with a pesticide called glyphosate. This is the active ingredient in Roundup. And they're being sprayed 
about eight days before harvest for a process called desiccation, glyphosate was not approved for this type of use, but this is now how it's being used. This is now the most abundantly used pesticide worldwide, and the reason that they spray crops with it immediately before they're harvested is because they get a higher yield. So if you think about your perennial flowers, or if you think about anything that you grow over the summer, there is not one single thing that all of a sudden on one day it's all ready to pick. Nothing, nothing works like that. Not, none of your flowers are all gonna be blooming at once. None of your tomatoes are all gonna be ripe at the same time. They have a staggered maturation. Grains and legumes are no different. They have a staggered maturation. But when they want to, but when they go to harvest these things, they can't harvest it multiple times. They have one shot and they're done. So if they spray it with glyphosate before they go out there, it kills the whole plant, forces everything to maturation at the same time, and then they end up with a higher yield. So that's why they're doing it, but then you end up with glyphosate in the food that you've eaten. So organic foods have not been sprayed with glyphosate, but the problem with glyphosate is that it's in our water cycle. It's hard to escape at this point. Um, so even if you are buying these organic foods, there may be a chance that that food has been exposed to glyphosate through the water cycle. Um, so glyphosate has received a lot of attention in the news for being a carcinogen. You hear about non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, some of the court cases that are going on in California. One of the things I don't hear people talking about is that glyphosate was registered as an antibiotic in 2010. So if you think that the most abundantly used pesticide worldwide is also a potent biocide, it's killing bacteria. I see this as a major problem, especially when you start to look at the benefits that bacteria have on your body and how we really need that relationship between those bacteria and our body in order to carry on a healthy, a healthy system. Um, so, I, I mean, I know that buying organic can be a challenge at times, but I think that if you can at least get educated about, well, maybe beans and grains are two of the things that really need to be focused on eating organic, um, that that can be kind of a starting point for some of this stuff. So hopefully, I've, I've, I haven't quite gotten into the soil stuff yet, and I'll get into that next, but hopefully what you're seeing is that your food is controlling your microbiome, and your microbiome is controlling your, the development of disease. But there is kind of this one last aspect that I want to take a, a little bit of time to discuss, which is the soil, because I think that our conversation around food needs to be expanded. You know, a healthy food is harder to determine now than it ever has been. Um, and so it can't just stop with, is it, is it a fruit? Is it a vegetable? Is it a whole grain? Sometimes that doesn't actually give you enough information about whether or not this is a healthy product. Um, so any questions before I keep moving? I don't know when you're going to get to it, but I'm particularly interested in what you do with your daughter who has to be on antibiotics for her whole life and how you reintroduce the microbiome. So I don't know if you want to get into that after the soil conversation or not, but that's, I'm really interested in how you do it in your family. Yeah, I can go ahead and answer that quickly. So for one, she's on a probiotic. Um, and then when she's on an antibiotic, she takes a, um, a certain type of probiotic called Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii is a yeast, um, so a yeast cannot be killed by an antibiotic. And so basically, the duration that she's on these antibiotics, she has to, I give her a yeast that is basically just occupying space that something bad could take up. So it's kind of like a protection mechanism to keep candida or something like that from overgrowing. Um, I mean, she has had C. diff uh, from repeated rounds of oral antibiotics followed by IV antibiotics. You know, this is just part of her life. Um, I hate it, but you know, that's what it is. And so, but she does, all, she takes a daily antibiotic and then I focus um, on the food piece because I know that the food is going to feed the bacteria and I wanna make sure that she's getting the right food. So does that help, does that answer your question? Yeah, the, uh, the yeast that you just described, is it in your book? That one? Uh, Saccharomyces boulardii? It's not, but um, you can either shoot me a message or I can give you the, after we're done, I can, give, I can spell that out for you. Um, but there aren't very many yeast probiotics. Um, are, do you know of any more? 
Is that, um, so, I mean, so even if you go to a health food store, you, if you Google yeast probiotic, to my knowledge, Saccharomyces boulardii is one of the only ones that's going to pop up. And do you, have, do you use the spore ones over the other probiotics for her? I use this company called Seed. Um, it's a newer company, and it seems to be working. I, I take it. My husband takes it. I have drank the Kool-Aid on that one. <laughs> so, um, what's that? Is it refrigerated? No, it's not. Um, but it's double capsulated. I can, I'll talk, if you want to talk to me more about that. And I am not affiliated with any company, just to be clear. Um, I only recommend things that I like because I genuinely like them, not because I am making any money off of them.